Well, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. We're going to bless the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. And he is coming soon. Soon and very soon, we are going to get to see the king. And uh, all people are going to bow down, ultimately, whether you know him or don't know him. And you, you need to know him because he's a beautiful God and wants to share his love and his blessings and his goodness with you and your loved ones. And so one of these days, he's coming back. The rapture, he's taking the church. And then we're going to be with him for seven years. But the people who get stuck down here are going to be in a horrible, horrible tribulation. And then ultimately the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then the millennium. And then the great white throne. Those who never wanted him. Those who ignored him. Those who despised him. Those who fought against him. Oh my. They're going to be up there at the great white throne. And at that time, they are going to bow. That's why the, the scripture tells us uh, that there is no higher name than Jesus Christ in Philippians 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. We are getting a head start. We're bowing now because we're in love with him. Not that we're trembling before him and we're scared of him. We fear him meaning we honor him, we reverence him. He's a beautiful God. And Father, that's why we worship you. We worship you because you're a good God. You're a holy God. And though our situation may not be good, you are always good. You were good yesterday. You are good today. You are good to tomorrow. You are good for eternity. You are a great God and all the other gods are just not gods. You are the real God and we worship you and honor you and love you and just fall before you and then get up and sing and sing and shout and say, God is our God and he is our, he is the one who is our refuge, our fortress, our banner, our salvation. He is the one that lifts us up with his righteous right hand and we are ever, ever thankful to you, Father. We're ever thankful to your son for redemption. We're ever thankful to the Holy Spirit who guides us day to day and directs us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray amen and amen, amen. So if you got your Bibles with you, let's go, let's go, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 12. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 12. And we, we read in, in uh, chapter 11 last time that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came and threatened them. He was going to take out the right eye. And, and uh, Saul, the Holy Spirit, fell on Saul. And they beat the living daylights out of Nahash and the Ammonites. And, and Nahash, the serpent, like Satan, had to flee. And that's what uh, Satan will do one day. He will flee. Although... By now, he's already defeated and he has no power, yet we, through sin, give him power. So look, just tell Satan, he's already made a, been made a public spectacle, Colossians 2.15 by Jesus Christ. You don't have to fear Satan. You and I only fear God. So now, uh, we're in, uh, so they're having a great celebration because they beat the Ammonites, right? The Israelites did. God uh, did miracles. And, and so now, Samuel is talking to the people of Israel as they're gathered in Gilgal, where they actually crossed the Jordan River four or five hundred years ago, right? Uh, to go and, and uh, conquer Jericho. So they're right there in Gilgal, right above the, the Dead Sea, uh, uh, north of, uh, of Jerusalem. And so his Samuel said to all the Israelites, Behold, I have hearkened to your voice in all that you have said to me and have made a king over you. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I'm very, very saddened that Samuel, the great prophet, the great priest, hearkened to the people of Israel. And this is a sad verse because they are intentionally choosing to forget God. They're saying, God, you yeah, we're the king in the past, but that's kind of old school. We want a king like, uh, you know, Canaan, and we want a king like uh, Egypt, uh, Pharaoh. We want, we want some kind of king we want to see. We can't see you, God. We want to see this king. And so they got Saul, seven foot tall, goodly, meaning handsome. And so they got Saul. And, and so Samuel's like, hey, I, I, I listen, I didn't want this. God doesn't want this, but I'm doing what you have asked to do. And then, you know, if you, when we read to Psalm 135, five through six, we see that God is sovereign over all things. He is sovereign over the heavens. He is sovereign over the earth. He is sovereign over the sea. He is sovereign, yet he will allow you and me to do what you and I want to do. Wow. It's like, you want it your way? You ain't no robot. I love you. I've set guidelines for you, but you can do what you want to do. And that's how good God is. He's just a beautiful God. And so now in verse two, it says, and behold, the king 
uh, walks before you and and I am old and and so he and I am gray headed. I mean, we we watch Samuel from chapter one uh, like a little baby boy and then a toddler and serving God and now he is old and gray headed and, and you know it kind of reminds me of Ecclesiastics where it talks about uh, be careful because you know the the lights will go out uh, the shutters will will fall and he's talking about people's eyes will dim and and teeth will fall as people age and and you know that's just part of life and um, but those who walk in the Lord, they're gonna they're going to re renew themselves like the eagles in the name of Jesus Christ. So don't be fallen. Say I'm gonna rise like the eagles because my Lord is with me. But it's Samuel saying, "Hey, look, I'm old. My sons are with you." Which means, look, you remember in in uh, chapter eight, verse three, the elders came and said, "We want a king." You're old, Samuel, and your sons, ah, they're like thugs. They they take bribes. And so Samuel's like, "Look, I'm not making my sons judges over you over the whole land of Israel. I'm just like they're like you. They're like the normal." congregation i'm following what you guys want to say and and, and in a sense he's passing the torch we, and yet while he's passing the torch he's going to say this torch it shines very bright and when i hand it off to saul you're going to see how dim this torch gets because you are disobedient and, and in a sense he's also like remember john the baptist in john chapter 3 verse 30 John the Baptist talked about Jesus Christ said, I must decrease, he must increase. Jesus Christ must increase. May it always be so in your life and my life that Jesus Christ must increase. You and I must decrease. And we lift up his name, we don't lift up our name. When we do that, we don't get depressed. People get depressed because they're trying to lift themselves up and somebody knocks them down. And they're like, I'm so depressed. Because you're thinking about you, but when you and I think about Jesus Christ, you cannot get depressed. We're like, oh, never mind. I'm lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what my situation, no matter what my hardship, no matter what my pain. It's not that we're stupid and we're ignoring the pain or whatever. But we're just like, I'm going to focus on Calvary Street. I'm going to focus on Jesus Christ. I'm going to focus on the blood. I'm going to focus on his miracles. I'm going to focus on his goodness. I'm going to focus on his mercy. And I'm going to praise his name. I will lift up. I must decrease. He must increase. And that's what Samuel's doing right now. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm bringing in Saul. I'm passing the torch. I'm not hogging my position. And so he goes, behold, behold here I am. I, and that's a fascinating thing for me. Here I am. That's what he said in chapter 3 when he was a toddler. Here am I when God was ta talking to him, remember? Here I am, he said, a witness against before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? And an ass word is not a cuss word. It's a donkey, like Saul was chasing his asses, his daddy's asses, his his donkeys. Uh, here's, uh, like, whose animals have I stolen? Or, or whom have I defrauded in verse 3? Or whom have I, have I oppressed? And what bribe have I taken? And so, you know, you read in Exodus chapter 23, verse 8, that anyone who takes a bribe has his eyes blinded. Oh my, meaning blinded to the truth, blinded to goodness, blinded to righteousness, blinded to God, and open eyes to satanic world. Don't go into bribery. Don't, don't take bribes from nobody. Go with the truth. Go with God. Just go, but go with God. In the name of Jesus. And so Samuel's like, here I am. You, look, I, I'm not, I haven't taken anything. But when I'm passing this torch, I want you to see how bright this light is. And and so uh, the people of Israel, they're there in verse 4. They're like, no, no, you haven't taken anything. They're talking about themselves. Hey, Samuel, cheat you? Did he do this to you? No, 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 no. He's a good man. He's been great since childhood. We love him. Yes. Uh, so... Um, they're like, oh, no, 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 you haven't defrauded us. You haven't oppressed us. Uh, uh, neither have you taken any, anything from man's hand. This is good. He's, when he's passing the torch, he's saying, look, look at the torch. It's shining bright. Old school, God being your king. I being your priest. I being your prophet through God. This was good days for you. I'm, I'm passing it on to what you wanted an image See what the image will do for you. And and he said, uh, the Lord witness against you. So in verse 5, he keeps on going. He's like, hey, I want to make sure here, people, I want you to understand that I've done what I've done. And I've done it righteously. And and he's like, and they're like, oh, no, no, he is our witness. You you have been good. He you, you have done righteously. And then Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and that brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt. So now we're going to get a history lesson. So Samuel is going to go backwards and going to give him a history lesson to show him how good God is and how selfish and unrighteous it was for them to have asked for a king at this time. 
And uh, now, therefore, stand still, he says. Chill out. Everybody wants to celebrate. Everybody wants to party. Uh, but he's like, uh, calm down. Stand still. I am going to tell you about the Lord and his righteousness and his righteous acts in verse 7. And so in verse 8, he says, When Jacob was come to, into Egypt, and your fathers cried to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. Now that verse in itself is 400 years. Because when Joseph came to Egypt, he, that, he brought his daddy Jacob to Egypt. And after a while, the, a new pharaoh came and didn't know the Israelites and Mr treated them, made them slaves. They were slaves for 400 years. And then comes Moses. So this, in one verse, you get 400 verses. But what's the act of righteousness here? That, the, uh, the, that God sent forth for, uh, that God sent forth Moses and he saved them. God, not, Moses didn't save them. He was an instrument used by God to save them. And so he, God saved them out of slavery. He made them free. And that's what God does for you. God will get you out of your prison. You know, in Isaiah 61, 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Talking about Jesus Christ and those who follow him. The Spirit of God is upon me. He has anointed me uh, to preach good tidings to the poor. And he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To, uh, to, so that, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And opening of prison doors for those who are bound. So if you are bound right now, if you are captive right now, whether it be drugs, whether it be alcohol, whether it be sexual impurity, whether it be pornography, whatever it may be, uh, even television, even sports, whatever it might be, like, I'm addicted, I've got to have this, I've got to have it. Opening of prison doors in the name of Jesus. Go. Go out freedom from bondage. That's one act of righteousness he recalls right here. And then in verse 9 it says, and they forgot the Lord their God. So he sold them into the hands of Sisera and uh, the captain of the host of Hazor into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the king of Moab and they fought against them. So, and you're like, this doesn't sound like a righteous act of God, but this was a chastisement by God, a punishment by God so that they may turn to repentance and it did turn them into repentance. So who's Sisera? Well, in Judges 4, 2, you'll see that Sisera was the king of the Canaanites and he was dogging the Israelites because they had turned to uh, the gods of this world. And, and so God said, oh, you, you want to choose to forgive me? That's cool. You can do that. But you're my people and you're supposed to shine my light, but you're not wanting to. So Sisera, go ahead, beat my people up. And so Sisera, the king of Canaan, started beating them up with his iron chariots. And all. God sent Deborah. This dude named Barak was supposed to help out, but he was like, oh, I can't do it. I'm too scared. And Deborah like, look here, child. I'm going to help you out. And so Deborah helps him out. Deborah the judge. And so that's Sisera. So God's kind of reminding him, look, I, you look, you were all, uh, you were enslaved. You became free. You became prosperous. And then you're like, we don't need God. And uh, the, a righteous act of God is chastisement. Now, that's on the other side of the cross. You understand? So the, they, Jesus Christ had not yet come to die on the cross. So on the other side of the cross, there is chastisement and there is punishment. And all punishment fell on the people. But when Jesus came, all the punishment of God fell on Jesus Christ. You see that in, in uh, Galatians 3.13, right? Where uh, the, Jesus Christ uh, took upon your and my sins on the cross. He took up your punishment and my punishment on the cross. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he ha who had no sin became sin so that you and I can become the righteousness of God in Christ. So, so he took the God's wrath and punishment and sickness, all, all not God's, but all the, all the punishment and all the wrath of God and the sickness that belonged to people all fell on Jesus Christ so that you and I may be healed. So uh, uh, Isaiah 53, 5, uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, 24, so that you, by his stripes we may be healed, that by his blood we may be saved. And it's, it's by grace through faith that you and I are saved, right? Ephesians 2, 8. So all this God did poured out his wrath because the wages of sin is death. So when we sin and everybody has sinned, don't nobody say, well, I don't sin. You were born with sin. So, so you and I were born with sin. So the wages of that is sin and it's eternal hell. But the gift 
of God, Jesus Christ, is uh, him dying on the cross and you and I, Romans 6, 23, having the gift of God, having eternal life, if we accept the blood of Jesus Christ. So on that side, it was punishment. On this side of the cross, after Jesus came, when you and I live, there's discipline, right? And it's that God, if people are like, well, God is punishing me and the Holy Spirit is punishing me and beating me up. Holy Spirit is the comforter. He does not beat you up. Get that right. If he's the comforter, the comforter does not beat you up. The comforter helps you. If we, we see it in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11, that God chastises those or disciplines those who he loves. Hebrews 12, 6, God chastises or disciplines those whom he loves. So the chastisement or the, the discipline on this side of the cross where we are is not a punishment. And you're like, well, it hurts. Well, you're right. When we shed off the road, uh, then we're in danger. And everybody blames it on God. God is uh, punishing me. No, actually, Satan got the stick and beating the living daylights out of you because you and I open the door to Satan when we sin. And we blame God for bad things while Satan entered into the door, gave him, we give him a foothold and, and he gets his foot in the door and beats us up. And he's the one that knocked on the door in the first place and said, do this, do this, do this, do this. And you're like, no, I don't want to, you know, do it, do it. It's fun. It's fun. And you and I do it. And then we're like, oh, why did it? And say, so like, ha, ha, I got it. I got in. And then he does all kinds of havoc. Blame Satan for nasty, but uh, the Lord does discipline. And that's a different thing than punishment. And so now, um, uh, where were we, y'all, before we went all crazy about the punishment and the... But know that this, the, the reason why this was uh, an act of righteousness on God's part is because this chastisement in Sisera's hand or Median's hand or Moab's hands, the enemy's hands, was it led them to repentance. They came back. It was a vicious cycle. They, they, because right, you see it here in verse 10. It, that's in the book of Judges. And, but here it, you see it in verse 10. And they cried to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Balaam and Asherah. Balaam, uh, the God of thunder, the God of lightning, the God of fertility, uh, G, little G. And they were like, Oh, Balaam, send us rain. Look, it's God who gives rain. And Asherah, the God of uh, sexual immorality, the female version of Balaam. And, and they used to worship. And even Molech, right? Molech, who they would hand their kids off to uh, uh, the hand, the, the, the image of this Molech, and they would burn their children. Uh, so Molech would send them rain or goodness or prosperity. And even God's like, hey, man, how do you, that didn't even cross my mind uh, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 7, verse 30 and 31. And so uh, the, the word forsaken the Lord comes over and over, by the way, in Jeremiah. You forsook the Lord. And, and that's years later now from 1 Samuel. Uh, we're talking about 400 years after this, Jeremiah comes on the scene. And he says, you forsaken the Lord over and over and over again. For, may it never be said about you and me that we forsook the Lord that we said no to him, that we dethroned him. And every day you and I have a choice to serve him with all our hearts and mind and soul, to love him with all our hearts, mind and soul, or to dethrone him with all our hearts and say, look, you get partial credit and I get most of the credit. No, may it never be said that about you or me. And these people were crying out of the Lord. And, and you know, they, they had the same Balaam and Ashtaroth over and over again. We saw that in, in chapter 7, verse 4, where they were worshiping and they had to break down Balaam and they had to break down the, the, the uh, idols of Ashtaroth. And, and it just comes over and over again. It's a nonstop thing. Uh, forsaking the Lord over and over again. It starts in Jeremiah 2, 17, chapter 2, 17. Over and over again, forsaking the Lord. In verse 11, and the Lord sent Jerubbabel. Who's Jerubbabel? That's Gideon. Same name, Gideon. Uh, Judges chapter 6, uh, Gideon the scaredy cat. He's like, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. I don't have courage. And so God's like, listen here, child. When I say go, you go because I will impart my Holy Spirit upon you. And when God says to you, go, don't be like, I can't go, I can't. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. Soar like the eagles. Let's go. 
And so that was uh, Jeroboam. And then uh, the Lord sent Jeroboam, and in verse 11 said, Badan. Who's Badan? We don't know. We can't find him in the Bible. And you know, well, those little people will say, well, well, that's uh, uh, that's why I pr I disproved the Bible. I say the Bible is wrong. You don't you don't disprove the Bible because of Badan. But uh, you can't disprove the Bible at all. You know, in John chapter 20, 21, the last chapter of John, in the last verse 25, it says, I, I, we cannot contain all the things that were done by Jesus Christ. If we do, the whole world can't even contain what he did. So you, you don't, we don't have all information. One day we'll get all information. Uh, we trust him in faith. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And Jephthah, Jephthah was another judge in uh, Judges chapter 12. And Samuel, he includes himself. He's like, this was old school when God was God and he was king. And he had, uh, he sent all these judges, including me, uh, Samuel, uh, uh, Samuel, the priest here. And they delivered you. We delivered you through the hands of God. Oh. And then he's, he even brings current, all the way to current in verse 12. And then you saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you. And you said, nay, but a king shall reign over us. What is the Lord your God? Uh, you know, when, when the Lord, no, I'm sorry. Nay, the king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. God, Samuel saying, your Lord, your God was king. Your Lord, your God saved you. Your Lord, your God loved you. Your Lord, your God walked with you. Your Lord, your God freed you. Your Lord, your God anointed you. Your Lord, your God set you as, as a, a holy nation amongst nations. That's the God you chose to reject. Wow. This is, I mean, this is some heavy, heavy words coming out of Sammy's mouth. So, um, so Samuel just tells him all this. You chose to forget God. Wow. Wow. This is heavy duty. And this is like in their face. This is like, uh, from victory. Now they're being like, oh, they can hardly swallow. They're like, oh my gosh, we've made a big mistake. What do we do? He's just handing the torch and saying, as I'm handing the torch, it shines bright. Uh, every, all the judges before me and myself, we shine this light bright for God. But you want a king, and we'll see what the king Saul does with the torch and the light of God. It doesn't end up well, by the way. And so now in verse 13, now therefore, behold the king whom you have chosen. Here, here's uh, seven foot tall, handsome Saul, and whom you have desired. And, and behold, the Lord has set a king over you. Look, the Lord, you wanted it. The Lord gave it to you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment, then shall both you and also the king reign over you. Continue following the Lord your God. And then in verse 15, if you don't obey, the Lord's hands will be against you. And I mean, this goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, right? You, If you hearken to my voice, if you listen to me, God says, I will deliver you. I will help you. I will heal you. I will give goodness to you. But if you don't hearken to me, if you disobey, then I will send plagues all upon you and it shall not go well with you. Same thing. I mean, the Bible uh, teaches the same thing. Let's walk with God. Let's obey God. Let's fear Him. Let's run after Him because He's not setting rules to hurt you and me. He's setting rules to love you and me and guide you and me and to help you and me and to prosper you and me and to heal you and me. That's why He set His rules down. And so in verse 16, Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Now something spectacular is about to happen. He's like, stand still chill. Everybody wants a boogie, 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 and, and party, 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 because they just won against the Ammonites, but he's like, stand still. Check this out. What's going to happen? Well, in verse 17, it says, it's not, is it not wheat harvest today? What does that mean? And everybody's like, yeah, what's, what kind of stupid question is this, uh, wheat harvest? Yes, that means it was an arid time. It was dry, dry, dry. There was no rain at this time. It was wheat harvest. And said today, uh, so, so Samuel's asking him, and they're like, yes, it's, it's uh, arid time. We know it. And I'll call upon the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, and that you may perceive and see that what you did was wicked. 
that your wickedness was great and that you have done in the sight of the Lord is asking you. Okay, so asking of a king, you have done very wickedly. And, you know, it goes back to Numbers 32, 23. Be sure your sins will find you out. And it goes back to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, that whatever you and I, God will not be mocked. Whatever you and I sow, that shall we reap. And so God, this is not like, well, you know, never mind. Uh, this is like he's, he's reminding them of their wickedness. This is terrible wickedness what you have done. Throw away God and want a king for yourself here. And so Samuel called on the Lord and, and God sent thunder and rain that day. And you're like, so what's the big deal? It's like, here's the big deal. It's, it's a June, middle of June, July. It's hot in downtown Los Angeles, July, let's just say. And you get two feet of snow and you're like, that don't happen. Well, it don't happen when rain thunders and comes down like this during this harvest time either. That's how much of a miracle that was. It was like clear skies and all of a sudden darkness and lightning and thunder and rain and it just doesn't happen. And that's what happened. And God's just reminding him. And they're like, in verse 19, they're like, oh God, pray to your God that we don't die. Very interesting. Pray to your God. I mean, I'll read it again. Uh, pray for your servants to the Lord, your God. I mean, in chapter 7, verse 8, they were saying, pray to our God. They were talking to Samuel. They were saying, pray to our God. And now they're saying, pray to your God. Look, it, it, it takes it, not a one-time deal, but over a period of time when people get away from God, he's not their God anymore. It just doesn't happen once. You know, kids go to school and they hear things that God is dumb. There ain't no God. You got to believe uh, academics instead of God and on and on. Things like that. And the kid over time goes like, well, there is no God. And, and, and the Christians the same way. Well, I went to church and really didn't get anything out of it. But they sang good. And, and on and on. And, you know, the pastor said, I'm good. And, and God will bless me. And, uh, and I should look for miracles in my life. And that's it. There's no salvation. There's no blood. There's no mention of hell that if the wages of sin is death meaning eternal hell but the gift of god is eternal life meaning heaven there's no mention of the blood of jesus dying on the cross for you and me none of that people don't know what sin is anymore in church they don't know it and so little by little then people like your god pray to your god and this is to me this is a tragic verse and in, in verse 20 and samuel said to the people fear not you have done all this wickedness yet turn not aside from following the lord but serve the lord with all your heart and again he's not saying fear not ah it's nothing don't worry about it uh you know men will be men women will be women boys will be boys girls will be girls no He's like, look, God will not abandon you. He still loves you despite the wickedness. He still loves you. Hebrews 13, 5, he will never leave you or forsake you. God is so good to you no matter what you've done, no matter what I've done, no matter what you said, no matter what I said, no matter what you thought, no matter what I thought. God loves you. He's not mad at you. His all madness and punishment went on Jesus Christ and he wants to love you and uphold you. And he will never abandon you. And then turn you not aside from then, should you go after vain things? Uh, he's like, don't go after vain things. They profit you not. You know, we, we read, uh, we'll read uh, ultimately in Psalm, I think it's 135, uh, verse 15, where these gods are made out of silver and gold, but they don't help you. These Ashtaroths and, and Balaam and uh, Baal or Baal, um, and you're like, I don't have Baal or Baal or Asheroth in my... You know, you ought to take a look in the mirror. Uh, we become our own gods and we dethrone God. And so it's time to uh, dethrone yourself and myself and put God back on the throne. And, and forget these, uh, you know, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, entertainment and all this. And people like, can't get enough and I got to go see another concert and I've got to do this and fine. I mean, there may not be no, no sin in it, but it will not satisfy. Only God satisfies. Things are vain. God is real. And God is love. And God is in love with you. And so, uh, for the Lord, in, in verse 22, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. I love that. He will not forsake, again, Hebrews 13, 5. He will not forsake you. He will never, ever, ever, ever leave you. 
His name is Emmanuel, Isaiah 7, 14. God is with you. God is not against you. Emmanuel does not mean God is against you. Emmanuel means God is with you. That's so good. And he will not forsake you for his name's sake. You remember Psalm 23, 23, 3. Well, it starts with the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul for his name's sake. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restores my soul and leads me in the paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. It's his glory. It's his honor. He doesn't want his name to go down. And so for his name's sake, he's like, look, no matter who you are, what you've done, no matter how far you've gone astray, for my name's sake, because I am love, I will pick you up and I will not abandon you. That's, that's a good God. That's a good God for his name's sake. And moreover, as for me, in verse 23, it says, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. But I will teach you the good and the right way. And so what a great leader, right? Number one, he's a leader that doesn't steal from people. Remember in, um, where was it? In chapter eight, where he was talking about the king. Yes, chapter eight, they, and from verse 11, he, the, the king will take, 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 take. He'll take your daughters. He'll take your money. He'll take your oxen. He'll take your sheep. He'll take your sons. He'll take everything from you. But I have taken nothing from you. Look at the torch as it's being passed uh, from Samuel to King Saul. And he's like, I've great leaders, don't take. Great leaders give. And maybe that's what the leaders throughout this world should know. They don't take from people. They give to people. They serve people. That marks a great leader. And so now he says, God forbid that I should stop, uh, that I should sin and stop uh, praying for you. A great leader prays for his people. So beautiful. And in and, and verse 24, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth and with all your heart for consider how great things he has done for you. Just fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. Uh, Proverbs 1, 7. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom to fear the Lord and fear him with all your heart. You don't need to fear people. Isaiah 2, 22. They just got breath. You don't need to fear uh, viruses and infections. The Psalm 91, the Lord is with you. You're underneath his shadow. You're underneath his defense. You're underneath Underneath his wings, you are underneath his love. He loves you. He protects you. You don't need to fear nobody except God. And fear, not like trembling, but fear is an honor and glory and love and, and worship and respect. And then last verse, it says, but if you shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed, both you and your king. Wow. He, he's giving them an option. He's, he's saying, here's the torch. It's your time to carry it, but go with God. Don't go with yourself. Don't go with your might. Don't go with your wisdom. Go with God. It reminds me of Ecclesiastes 12. I'm going to turn there real fast and, and end with this. Uh, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, um, and uh, verse 12, where it's the end of the matter. It's the, it's the bottom line. It's uh, it's. Uh, this is the conclusion of the whole matter, if you will, of your life, of the purpose in life. And it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Wow. To fear him is to love him. To love him is to walk with him. To walk with him is to serve him. To serve him is to obey him. To obey him is to be his son and his daughter and bring glory and honor to him. May that be said about you. May that be said about me as we serve our Lord and love him forever and ever and ever. Amen and amen. God bless you and keep you and shine his beautiful, beautiful, beautiful face upon you. Whatever there is of sight beside you, whatever's harming you, whatever's pressuring you, whatever's aching you, whatever's making you go in pain, whatever's breaking you, put it aside, take it to Calvary and say, Father, I'm just going to hand this off to you. I'm going to magnify you. I'm not going to magnify this pain. I'm going to magnify you. 
and I shall wait on you, and I will be renewed, as your word says. I will be revived, and I will soar in the name of Jesus, and I will serve you all the days, because you are my king. Amen and amen. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings to you and your loved ones.